All right. Um, I'd like to. We all see the same Brady Bunch grid, right? So I think let's start with uh, Charlie, and then let's just go through the grid. Why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us about what it is you do. Sounds good. I'm Charlie Pulsifer. I write a young adult science fiction and fantasy, and I am also a cardboard artist. I create little tiny, itty bitty sculptures out of cardboard and paper that turn out pretty cool. They're awesome. They're amazing. <laughs> so good. Okay, am I next on your grid? Because I'm next on my grid. Yes, you are. Okay, all right. I'm Jessica Guernsey. I'm a slush pile reader, which also means my job description is the crusher of dreams. Um, and I am a, a short story writer. So I have a few short stories out. So that's probably why I'm on this panel. I am not artistic in any manner, cardboard or else. I'm Christy S. Gilbert from Loose Leaf Editorial and Production. I'm a book editor and designer. And so I think that's probably why I'm on the panel, because I, <laughs> I try to edit more senses into fiction. Uh, I'm Michael Brent Collings. Uh, I've written a bunch of books, and I'm international bestseller. I'm best known for horror, but I've written bestsellers in everything from horror to humor to romance. Uh, I've written a couple of movies as well, which are totally visual, uh, but I, because it's horror, I deal a lot with the unseen and I do have to talk a lot about the other senses and oh my goodness, it makes such a difference. And I'm Stephen Gashler. I write uh, young adult science fiction fantasy as well, as well as humor. I also do uh, musical theater and a YouTube channel and I compose and a few other things. All right, so let's talk about Sensory details. Uh, first question, why is having sensory information important? Let's just go through the same order, Charlie, if you'll start with that for us. Okay. I was just waiting for someone else to jump in, but I'll, I'll go. Um, there have been some interesting studies that, uh, that while you're reading, you experience the same things that you're reading. So if you're like reading about someone running through the forest, then the parts of your brain that have to do with motor function and movement light up. And if you smell something, then the parts of your brain that have to do with olfactory levels light up as well. And so, so you're literally dropping into someone's head. If you're not using all the senses, you're not giving your readers that opportunity to fully immerse themselves into this character, to fall into that person and live as that person for however many pages your book ends up being, which is the whole point of a book, is to let that person fall into someone else's soul. Uh, along with that, um, the five senses also help you develop the setting, which when you're writing short fiction, you have a very short amount of space to actually get the setting across in a clear manner. So uh, using more senses gives the per person a, a fuller picture while also giving insight into the character, uh, how they see the things. You know, someone might walk into a room and go, ooh, peppermint. And someone might be like, oh my gosh, peppermint. You know, so <laughs> it, that gives us good characterization also. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you're not using all the senses, you're just leaving a lot of tools on the table. Uh, different senses can convey a different amount of intimacy or, you know, invasion, depending on what it is, like scent, because you're actually taking it into your body, like it feels more intimate, or if it's something awful, it feels like way more of a violation. And also, if all your details are visual, it honestly can start to get monotonous, even if they're all really good details, your reader isn't going to remember all of them as well, because they're all using the same sense, and they can kind of start to run together. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's a wonderful point that Christy just made. And I, I used to edit a little bit and um, I would always write that note. This is only visual. Tell me the rest of the stuff. And as a reader, you have to remember that each of these senses, the reason we have numerous of them is because they all have different functions and they all do different things in our brain. And so if you want to capture somebody in the net of your narrative, like just completely reel them in, you can't leave out all the most important ones. I mean, everybody really focuses on visual, but we only take in something like 20% of our information interpersonally visual. And so much of the rest is 
other things that are happening as a, around us. It's just, we tend to filter those, our brain does, but they're still there. And knowing what each sense does, like peppermint smell is so powerful for launching memories. Like there's a proven connection between those two things. And if we can tap into all of those actual scientific routes into memory and into experience, you have a story that just won't let people go. So next question, when do we want to use sensory details? When are they important? And inversely, you could answer, when are they perhaps unnecessary or excessive? That's a tough one because it's always a, a balance. <laughs> you have to um, not overwhelm people with senses. Same thing like if you were to walk into a stadium and the music's blasting and people are screaming at each other and and there's popcorn and stuff flying in through the air and you have all these different senses commingling and it takes you a second to get your orientation. Uh, same thing with, with books. It, uh, you suddenly sprinkle them throughout your descriptions and um, try not to overwhelm people with all your, your descriptions. You don't want purple prose happening where it's just page after page after page of descriptions hitting all the senses. But it also has to make sense with your character. Like um, if they're walking through something and they are touching a railing, then you might want to mention the railing and the sensation of the cold metal or the rusted metal or whatever texture it is to give them that, that extra, I'm going to say visual, but it's because your brain takes a sensory description and sometimes translate it into visual, which is one or another reason to use like texture and things like that, because it helps fill in that, that visual range for people as well. So you may want to avoid uh, going on for 50 pages about the description of the sewers a la Victor Hugo. <laughs> oh, don't yes. be knocking yes. Victor Hugo. Oh my God. <laughs> Fighting words. <laughs> but along yeah. with what Charlie was saying, it's also about the depth so adding that texture, adding that, you know, just that brief little whiff of smell, that's going to make your scene a lot more vibrant. However, it usually in action sequences, getting a little too strong with the smells and things, that's distracting. And unless you want your character to be distracted in the minute, like, wait a minute, why is there peppermint here? And that serves a purpose. You're going to want to be careful how deep you go on action sequences when it's go, 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 not stop and smell the rose. One thing that I ended up talking a lot about is where you want the proportion of emphasis and also picking the right detail. Like if you're taking the time to describe everything all the time, um, you get the narrative equivalent of the visual busyness of a Michael Bay movie. And you can't remember anything that's going on because you're being bombarded with so many details all the time. So wait for something that's emotionally important or important to the character. But if they're just walking through a parking lot to get somewhere else, you don't need to describe the parking lot very much. If they're standing in the parking lot while they process a bunch of information, then maybe spend some time mentioning that they counted how many cars there were and that like there are 11 red cars and that helped them calm down. Or maybe they're standing there like retching over the smell of the dumpster and that might help show that re like their their recovery from the previous scene but also like pick your details even if you know the love interest sees their you know the main character sees their love interest obviously they're going to be interested in lots of the details they're enamored whatever but try to pick a few that are going to be the most important instead of describing them head to toe like a head to toe description not great emphasizing like how beautiful their eyes are or how good they smell or how much you want to like just curl up into their like lovely arms like these are bad i'm i don't write romance i'm I bad was gonna at ask, it do you <laughs> like romance christy no. wow <laughs> like, no, no bad i should have gone with something else um, but but like pick pick a couple of those details that you can set up to be something that you come back to and create a theme with rather than this head to toe description of every single detail that just makes it so you pause the scene while we deal with details. The epitome of uh, telling, not showing, you know, and when that's 
just terrible stuff to do. I think also we want to have, first of all, I, everybody has said such cool things. I love panels where I can take notes. Um, but I think it's really important to remember that whatever you're choosing as a sensory detail, it should matter to the story or the character and in the best world to both. So if you're putting in peppermint, it's not just, you know, people say it's for flavor, you know, for the scene. And that's fine, but it's not as powerful as if that matters to the story or if that keys something to the character. And when we're talking about using all the senses or senses, sometimes you've described something visually rather than add something, just cut all that visual stuff out and choose a different sense to add that flavor while still promoting your story. So like I write a lot of horror and action and in the middle of somebody getting disemboweled by a madman with a hook arm based on Charlie, um, I'll have him noticed the sound of the crickets in the background. And for the rest of his life, that's going to scar him. You know, she hears the sound of a particular tune and then her mother plays it later on in the book and she vomits because of fear. You know, so these kind of things, they not only give flavor to the scene, that's so important for drawing people in, but you don't want to pause it. You don't want to just stop like Christy said and say, okay, now we're going to tell you interesting things to show that I notice stuff. We want to provide the experience and clarify it for the reader and then not just clarify it, but sort of give them instead of a couple random threads, this beautiful tapestry that they can examine over and over. Great. Well, we've talked about why add sensory details. We've uh, talked about when we want to add sensory details. Now let's talk a little bit about how to add effective sensory details. And I feel bad because we've been picking on Charlie. He's had to think the fastest. So this time let's pick on Michael, <laughs> Brent, and we'll go backwards, okay? Oh, Jessica, I love that that just happened. Just FYI. <laughs> That's my life. I was trying um, so hard to be like, shh, quiet, I'm on a panel. And no one heard me. No one heard me. I love it. I love it. And, I, you know, <laughs> just as an aside, I love that our culture has evolved to the point where I can have like an important business meeting and the cat leaps across the screen and everyone's like, it's cool. We've all had it happen. <laughs> also, um, cats are awesome and we want to see it there. Yeah. Break the Internet. Um, how we do it, you know, I actually kind of it's funny because people do tend to focus on the visuals and I have a little bit of a leg up because I am not a visual person. And by that, I mean, I discovered 15 years in my marriage, my wife was watching me read and she's like, how do you read so fast? And we had the, she's, she said, you can't be picking stuff up. And she kind of gave me a book quiz to see if I was actually reading. And it turned out I can read really fast because I have no pictures in my head. I'm just enjoying the language. And that process is much faster than if I'm building this imaginary scene. So one of the nice things to do if you are a very visual person is close your eyes. I mean, take away that sense of, uh, that you're over focusing on. I will go to a, you know, if I'm researching a city, I'll go to a picture of that city and then zero in on some aspect of it. Wow, that's a slum. What does that smell like living on top of each other? I mean, I thought I lived in South America and I thought it would be like the land of beautiful smells because it's pristine and pure. And it smelled like a freaking dumpster fire full of tires. You know, it was really terrible and it was a surprise and it so radically shifted my viewpoint. So I think if you can really focus on, on just one or two little aspects that are not your normal as the author, I think the extra care that you have to take to pick them up is going to be reflected in the in the accuracy and in the interest of your story. So on that note, if you don't know what your normal is, if you're like, oh, yeah, I use all sorts of details or do I use all sorts of details? Like t find some random scene in your book, grab a few colors of highlighter and yellow is visual, blue is smell, like assign the senses to your highlighters and well, go green through. Green is actually smell, green is smell. Okay, green is smell. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and just go through and highlight it so you can see what your tendencies are. And then once you know what your tendency is, that's, that's not necessarily good or bad, whatever your tendency is, but it can make you aware of it so you can make more conscious decisions. And you can be like, okay, 
given my tendency, if I really want to make this one moment stand out, how can I break my norm the most? And if you're always using sounds and sight, then use touch, like have your character physically interact with the, th with the thing. Um, or if you happen upon a scene where it's all yellow and there's nothing else, then you've found your problem. You need to get rid of some visuals and that maybe that's all, maybe just get rid of some visuals, <laughs> but get rid of some visuals and add in some other things. But that can be a helpful diagnostic if you're not sure where you fall on the spectrum of what do you use the most? Where, where are those problems? Just pull little sections out of your work and do a highlighter run. And it's okay to have mostly visuals. That's how most people process information was like 60% of the information you process is visual. So it's okay to have mostly visual, but you're really going to want to add the depth, add the experience by adding the other senses. So yeah, Christy has a great idea. That's what I do. I like to do the highlighters or the colored pencils if I'm hard up. And, um, but yeah, green is smell. <laughs> <laughs> Green for Probably. peppermint. Fast peppermint. I was thinking that. <laughs> Fast and furious and peppermint. Me green. I was thinking grass, but you know, whatever works for you. It's okay. You artist types are a little weird. It's okay. This is true. So speaking of weird, I learned in college that we create sensory maps all the time. And so we we rely on our visual map more than anything else. So I'm very spatially aware. I always know which direction is north when I'm in a, inside a building. I always know if I go out that exit and turn right, then I am facing the building that I want to be heading towards. And I just know that. So I'm, I'm very spatial. But I learned that you create these other sensory maps. So you have a map for smell and you have a, a map for touch and you have all these other maps happening that we don't really think about. And... I also learned that it was really good for your brain to rely on these maps. And so I started taking showers in the dark. So I'd like turn off all the lights and I'd take a shower from start to finish in the dark with my eyes closed and find all the soap and the shampoo and the loofah and whatever you're looking for by touch. And I do the same thing. I, I wander around my apartment in the dark and just go by. Uh, my memorized spatial map and then also by smell like you can actually pick up different scents throughout your your house even if it's small and so i do that for fun and then i do that <laughs> i do that dressed with a t-rex dressed as a t-rex yes <laughs> <laughs> and then i do that in my books too where i will get to a scene and be like okay i've written mostly visual descriptions here i need to sink into the other maps and so i will close my eyes like michael brent suggested and then i will walk through the scene as that character and visualize my texture my touch scene my that map and figure out what he's touching what wh where he's going um the the way the the flooring feels underneath his feet because it like wood concrete stone everything feels a little different shock waves through your body and so i try to kind of feel my way through a, a scene and then smell my way through a scene and and figure out how to interject these in little minor ways that will make a big difference to the reader that was a so lot. that was good some sensory details we can readily identify with, such as the colors of sunsets, the pinks and the oranges, or maybe the sound of a barking dog in the distance. Uh, some things are a bit harder to describe, uh, specifically the tasting and smelling and feeling sensations. So given that some of these are, are overlooked, as we talked about, we tend to do the visual and the auditory, but especially the visual. Um, what are some tips you might have, and anyone can answer this in any order, for describing some of these harder to describe sensations? Work. I, you know, it, it's funny. Well, people are like, oh, it's harder to do. Duh. It, that doesn't mean you just give up. You know, if you're, this is your job is what people want, I'm assuming. And that's why they're doing all these panels, you know, and, and paying attention to this stuff. 
So you want it as a job and you don't get in any other job, you don't get to be a brain surgeon and go, hmm, now that I'm in here, I just realized this part's really hard. Pass. You know, you can't do that. <laughs> and you can't do that as an author. So just because you're used to describing it visually, when you get to a moment where you're like, I need to describe flavor is a great one. It's possible. You might have to think a little harder about it is all if you're describing an orange. And it's interesting because you'll use other site or other um, sensory descriptives for that orange. It has a bright, clean taste. You haven't said anything about like its impact on your taste buds. You're talking about feel and visual there, but it very clearly communicates that citrus that we all love, you know, that that palate cleansing feel of that sort of thing. So just if you get to a part and you go, wow, I'm having real trouble. Sucks to be you, man. I mean, just do it anyways. And as you do it, it's like any other linguistic idiosyncrasy. You can adopt it and make it very second nature or even primary nature. And along those lines, I also think it it's not necessarily that you have to be able to get the other person to know exactly what you're talking about. Um, like when you say something is the pink of a sunset, it's not so they know exactly what pink it is. It's so you get the emotional note of a sunset into your scene. So I can say I went outside and the air smelled of dying worms. And that is the smell after a massive rainstorm when all the worms come out and it's like slightly metallic and they're all dying, but I don't need to spend a bunch of time being like, yeah, it's that weird metallic smell taste thing you get after like a long rainstorm. I just have someone walk out and the world is sopping wet and smells like dying worms. And you even if, rain for me. <laughs> even <laughs> if you. no one's made that connection in their brain, yeah. like not everyone has realized that that's what that's that metallic smell after rain is. Um, that it's dead worms on the sidewalk. But even if you don't know that, I don't have to get you to smell what dying worm smells like. I've painted a scene. That's not a romantic scene. It's not a playful scene. It's a gross, upset, depressing scene. And I've conveyed that emotion, even if I haven't let you actually know what dying worms smell like. Okay, see, most people after the rain, it's like, oh, it's all the clean, it's the petrichor, and you're like, dying words. Okay, and that, that, it smells nice. It's a really good point. It's, it's the word choice. You know, if you're eating an orange and it smells clean, that that's a different word choice. If I'm eating an orange and it's sour and bitter, you know, that's going to convey a different tone for the, the scene that I want, for the character that I'm working with or the emotion I'm trying to evoke. So it, it's, it's the power of your words. You have to pick and, you know, That's what's really going to get the the scene across. It's going to make your readers have that connection with your character to feel immersed in that world is, is conveying the right tone by the words you pick. You're not going to pick, you know, petrichor and the cleanness of after rain. You're going to pick friggin' dying worms because there's a murderer after you and everyone's going <laughs> to die, you know? So you want to, you want to make sure that the senses you bring in Add to the story and and really build out that character, build out that tone. Yeah, that says a lot about your point of view character. A lot in just a couple of words. <laughs> Dying worms. I mean, I'm we like, already know it's not a romance, right? Yeah. <laughs> we already I've, we already I've know. never found a time when it's appropriate to use that description yet, but I, I have it in my back pocket. <laughs> you you need to at some point now because it, it is beautiful. It really is. Like I always think of sagebrush and petrichor and the sweet, dusty scent of rain, but no, dying worms. Drowned in dying you know, worms. Christy uh, did something cool too, because I don't know about everybody else, but she said it smells like dying worms. And my first thought wasn't, oh, that's really smart. I was like, what the crap? <laughs> you know, I had no freaking clue what was happening. I, yep. Like, I went, wait, is this a thing? Does everybody, is there like a trend on Twitter? Hashtag smells like dying worms or something I don't know about. You know, like the missing out on There will be syndrome. after this panel. Yeah. <laughs> it has to have I, rained I like know. all night. Like those worms have to be saturated out of the soil. <laughs> but, yeah, but listen, I was in it. I was like, okay, I am zeroed in on whatever she's saying next. Because that was way different, way interesting. 
And that really highlights one of the great things about using these different sensory descriptives is it's a good way because we're used to seeing it visually in a book. You know, it was blue eyes. It was a bright day. And then somebody says something, it smelled like dying worms. And it provides a real interesting narrative voice, which is one of the hardest things to develop as an author is to sound unique, you know, so that when people read a Michael Brent Collings book, they're like, oh, it sounds like Michael Brent. And that being a good, a good thing. And so if you use these alt descriptors for different senses, I mean, people are already conditioned not to be ready for them because sight appears so overwhelmingly. And so you can catch them off guard. You can spin a new term of turn of phrase, which yes, I will use that one on my wife next time we're having a romantic out in the rain. <laughs> like I look at you, honey, and I, I just smell dying worms and it's all that's right in the world. And it, but it's fantastic. And she did it punchy, you know, she did it quickly. And I think that's something that's lost too, is whenever we do talk about how something smells, we're like, I went to all this work because I'm not used to stinky talk. And so because I went to all this work, I'm going to describe it for the next eight pages. <laughs> and by the way, the smell happened during a sword fight, you know, and it's like <laughs> he's fighting for his life. And then he goes, did someone fart? And it's eight pages of farting during a sword fight scene. Whereas it smelled like dying worms, pow, and moving on. That was that was such a good example in microcosm. I loved it. Like that's hashtag smells like dying worms. Uh, that was such a good example, though. Like do that. Hit them hard and fast, unique, and do it in such a way where they have confidence. This is a person who's going to take me places I have never been before. Yeah. I think the question before the dying worms took over was how you, how you research, how you figure out. <laughs> I can't even remember now. Sorry. <laughs> um, That's okay. Go ahead, I, Charlie. I do like, I, I travel, I, I love traveling. And so everywhere I go, I try to create my little mental maps of things. And so I, I try to remember like the way things felt and smelled and taste and, like how cold it was and and all these things that you don't normally think about when you just visit someplace but I actually like try to internalize and hold on to those and then try to use them again later and if I'm stuck on something I'm not adverse to going down to a restaurant and ordering something and trying it and being like oh yeah it has little notes of this and this and this and I forgot that it kind of tastes a little bit like dying worms and pomegranate <laughs> Note to self, don't go. Charlie's restaurant. <laughs> I think it's safe to say we all have the image of worms and rain in our head right now. So well done. And Olive Garden, <laughs> thanks to Charlie. Woo! <laughs> it's gonna so, be interesting. We're gonna get that on shirts next year. It smells like dying worms in here. <laughs> <laughs> what are some examples of great sensory details you've either read or seen in any sort of media that have stuck out to you that we could learn from? Again, anyone can answer. Hit me really hard when I was younger was The Haunting of Hill House mm. by Shirley Jackson, which if you're thinking about doing scary stuff, uh, thrillers even, and you haven't read that, shame on you. Uh, it is such a masterclass. And there is a scene where the main character is laying in bed and it's this haunted house and she's laying with a brand new friend who she's really kind of imprinted on and she's terrified because there's sounds and she feels something and it's pitch black and she reaches over to hold hands with her best friend and they go through this terrifying moment with no visuals. It's all sound, it's all imagination, it's the feel of each other's hands and then the lights go on and her best friendy thing uh, is asleep and clear across the room. And this girl is left to say, whose hand was I holding? And so the lack of visual imagery creates not just a terrifying internalized environment, but it also creates one of the great payoffs in, in horror writing, you know, in, it's great Gothic horror. 
none of it is seen and horror particularly when it's written i mean there's slashers that exist for explosive disembowelment um but a lot of horror horrors so effective when here's the bad guy and he moves here and that's where everything happens so not being able to see something in terrifying work is particularly useful but read the whole book the haunting of hill house so good i love that we got a creaking door from jessica's Mike, just as that happened. Yo, I swear. I like sent three messages to the group chat, like, please leave me alone. <laughs> so I've got a couple examples of sensory details. Um, I recently read The 10,000 Doors of January by Alex E. Harrow. And uh, it's about uh, doors between worlds. And one of the ways that you can know you're near a door, even when you don't see it, is you can smell the other world. Bef way before you cross over. And so there are certain smells associated with certain wor worlds that become more emotionally important and they become very poignant. And just because that sense is so clearly tied with that, that part of the magic. And so I think that was a really well done, well chosen use of sensory detail in there. And I'm also a big fan of The Last Unicorn by Peter S. Beagle. It's one of my top five favorite books ever. And Beagle is really, really great at tiny, short descriptions that are so evocative. And he uses all sorts of different senses in there, but he doesn't spend paragraph upon paragraph describing a scene. Um, the book's very short. And part of that is because he doesn't linger on his descriptions very much. He just trusts um, the power of his really interesting juxtapositions of senses and a the words he chooses to describe them. Okay, so the example I'm going to use is a movie, and it's a really dumb movie, and I hated it, but there's this one scene, and one of the main characters, I forget what the, it's called, um, it's Nicolas Cage in it, and Meg Ryan, and he's an angel, and City he falls in love with her, and he goes down to earth, basically, and he asks her what a pear tastes like. And she's like, well, what do you mean? How do you not know what a pear tastes like? And he's like, well, I don't know what it tastes like to you. And I was just like, oh, oh my gosh, because different things have different emotional connotations. And so you're going to use different words like the worms. I hate to go back to that. We are beating the dead worm now. But um, she describes pears as being like uh, uh, dissolving like sand. And I never thought of pears like that before. So I think of that um, example often, unfortunately, because it was a stupid movie, although the soundtrack is really good. Um, and uh, they uh, uh, use that when I'm thinking of my sensory details. What does this taste like or what does this feel like or what does this sound like to this person? So like the creaking door to one person might be absolutely horrifying, like me, if you're on a panel right now. But if um, <laughs> if, if I w was waiting for someone to come, like maybe it's romantic and it's it's Valentine's Day and I'm waiting with the petals and the, the champagne. And then when the door creaks, it's a much more different feeling that I'm evoking. So uh, you, you got to think about what it sounds like, what it tastes like, what it feels like to your character. So I'm going to be one of those authors who's like, my example, I'm going to go to my books. <laughs> <laughs> in my book. Um, but I, I cheated in my last series. I gave my, my main characters all magical synesthesia, which is where um, you have an intersection of senses where you see colors and then you might experience them as scents as well. And I did that with magic. So my magic system is color-based. And so they see the different colors and then they experience some sort of synesthesia with magic. And so I have a character who smells and tastes magic and I have a, a character who hears magic and so they'll describe like the same thing and both be describing like the whole magic coalesces into sounding like a circus to her and to him it smells and tastes like a circus so he's getting um saw sawdust and and hay and um peanuts and things like that and she's getting like elephants trumpeting and things like that and so i i, I got to play 
a lot with those. And then I'm adding texture for a new character in my next book. And so I get to play a lot with those by cheating a little bit. In the book that one's the blue door, the right? Color. Yes, the blue door. Very good. That sounds cool. Really quick, Let's... too. Um, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Is it okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, one thing, too, is you can you can use senses to dress up an idea in sheep's clothing. Um, you can lay out a scene purporting to use a sense that really has nothing to do with it. So, so this book, Lost Girl, here, it's a YA uh, supernatural paranormal kind of thing. And I remember describing a high school hallway. It smelled like hormones and desperation. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of those. I mean, hormones, pheromones have a smell, but hormones really don't. I mean, unless you're like a scientist going, mm, this petri dish <laughs> smells lemony. You know, there's not a smell to hormones or to desperation. But anybody who's walked down one of those high school hallways goes, oh, my God gosh, that was my entire junior year or, or whatever. And so it, instead of saying something much less elegant, I got a feeling of hormones and desperation as I walked down the hall, which is very pedantic. It's boring and it's very on the nose. You know, the hall smelled like hormones and desperation. And again, it's like the dying worms. It's, it's fast. And, but a punch is fast. You want to hit them and just like a punch, the bruise lingers. You know, it it stays in their brain and kind of curls its way around until it becomes part of them. Ultimately, you want to create not just a world, but a world that once they've put the book down, they're still in it. They just can't escape it. And it's become part of who they are. I think I finally understand the meaning of Kurt Cobain's smell like team spirit. <laughs> 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 All right, let's move on to questions. Let's move on to questions. I thought okay. we were doing questions all along. <laughs> Sergeant Moose questions. asks, any tips on characters with different sensory capabilities than humans, like dogs, dragons, etc.? Hmm? Well, the good thing is, is that no one actually knows, so you can pretty much make it up and we'll all buy it, you know? <laughs> Um, I do think leaning into those sensory differences can be really helpful. Like a dog is going to navigate by smell a lot more than a human does. And so like, to, like lean into that difference and, and emphasize it. Um, but you can also see this in uh, the, the Fifth Kingdom by N.K. Jemisin. Uh, the humans there have their like five senses and also they can cess, which is fe essentially feeling earthquakes. And everyone can cess to some degree, um, but like the magically afflicted can really cess. Like they can, they can feel the vibrations of your footsteps across the room. And so that's a book that makes use of a different sense uh, all the time. Like every character in there can cess. Dean Gunt yeah. has a love affair with dogs, and. Um before his later work is i think a little too far but some of his earlier stuff you can find a lot of dog point of view and it's actually really wonderfully done because it's like rock rock squirrel squirrel smell and he goes really hones in on kind of the playfulness but he also it, it is all smell he doesn't once talk about what the dog is seeing he just follows the trail the scent oh there's a squirrel over there no stay on target find boy find boy and and so that's a really good example. If you want to just read some Dean Koontz, you're going to, you can't throw a Dean Koontz book in a river without getting a dog wet. Yeah. And there are a lot of animal, insect, and other creatures that exist in our world that have senses that we do not, that you could tap into and play with. Um, there are like uh, pit vipers that can sense heat. And so, you could very easily have a dragon that can also sense heat and sees the world in infrared a little bit. And, and then like bees see spectrums of light that we don't see. And it'd be fun to play around with some of those things. Okay. Uh, next question. When you're making a new scene, 
When describing your setting, do you have to use all five of your senses? No. No, your scene's going to no. be cluttered. It's, you're, that's, that's, that's too much. Um, I mm -hmm. write a lot of science fiction, and it takes place in space. And there's not a lot of smell in space, so I try to work in smell where I can, but it's used very sparingly, you know. So it, yeah. if you don't need everything, you're going to overwhelm. Yeah, when you're setting your scene, it's a there's a fine line between giving your reader enough that they can like conceptualize the scene and follow what's happening and know where they are, but uh, like get get to what's going on, like do it as efficiently as possible with as as few details as you can while still getting the emotion and enough of the set pieces as you need. Um, but I wouldn't sit there and like have a checklist and be like, I got my scent, I got my smell, I got. Uh, those are also, the same characters thing. frequently yeah. <laughs> don't lick stuff so your taste isn't really a factor i lick stuff all the time i don't know you're what you're not talking a about. Yeah. character charlie i keep telling you you're a real person <laughs> i can exist in more than one place <laughs> do we have another question um nope we don't have another question oh, okay. well, <laughs> we are that on that good. that good. On the on that note, um, there are some fun times you can play with, like smell and things when you do do deal with space. There, like when we went to the moon, you're in your spacesuit and you don't really have smells because it's all filtered and you're mm -hmm. just getting pure oxygen. But when they they dragged the moon dust back inside, they all said the moon dust had a smell and it was kind of this rotten, eggy smell. And then they're like, oh, well, it's nice to know that the moon smells a little bit like farts. Yeah, we know. <laughs> well, I mean, it's made of green cheese. What did you expect? <laughs> <laughs> and so anytime you drag something in from space, there there might be smells and new textures and, and interesting ways to play with that. But while you're in the spacesuit, there's not much. Yeah. Well, and you know what's interesting about that is you're you're talking about a uh, an interstellar submarine. And that is if you read World War II uh, journals and accounts someone would come into a submarine and throw up immediately. Oh. This scentless place that all of the men were used to, it wasn't scentless. And I guarantee you, if you stick your nose in Neil Armstrong's space boot, it's going to be an unpleasant experience. <laughs> and so no matter where you are, you can, you can get out these nice little things. And some of them give such cool detail. Like I had never thought about, getting on a submarine with a bunch and world war ii a bunch of dudes who have just been stewing in their own stink for days on end you know and and it added such a vibrant experience to vibrant. Reading a yeah that's the word <laughs> yeah Fun it, it made it live like i'll never forget that just thinking about like oh my gosh i go camping and the inside of my tent smells like it should be a war crime what would a submarine be like <laughs> and and the same thing with uh like oh, lots of cool space stories but there there was another astronaut whose sweat mis mixed with the anti-fogging material in his face shield and then it got into his eyes and so he couldn't see and he was outside like clinging to the outside of a space shuttle, terrified because he couldn't see. Um, like just the idea of dealing with textures through the muted gloves and the pain stinging in his eyes and not being able to see and just crawling along the outside of a space shuttle by touch, knowing that the void is out there while he's blinking, trying to get it out. Like you can have a lot of fun. Man, with that would be intense. <laughs> Yikes. How about, yeah, remove a sense, you know, take something away. I, I, when I lived in South America, there's no noise pollution. I was living in the jungle and what little electricity there was, was intermittent. And one night we were pretty far out in the middle of nowhere and all of the lights went out and that could be 15 minutes. It could be three days. And we had to figure out how to get home from this place where we were a mile and a half, two miles away which part of it was a road, a dirt road, and part of it was just trees. And it was, boy, a whole other experience than going down with a street light in the distance. So if you steal one of those senses, I mean, why not have your sword fight in an underground parking lot and the lights are 
go out for a story related reason. I mean, that makes it a very different thing. And we've all seen a sword fight. How many of us have seen a sword fight with two people who know there's a stabby person out there and have to figure out how to find them? A stabby person. You are such <laughs> a talented writer. Mm-hmm. I mean, the wordsmith. It's just. <laughs> I am I the tiny so worm smell of all. <laughs> I didn't say that. That was Christy. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We just have a few minutes left. Um, I want to give everybody a chance just to go around and take 30 seconds or more to uh, tell us what we can look forward from you in the future and how fans can stay in touch. Uh, Charlie, do you want to go first this time? Sure. Charlie Pulsifer. You can find me on Amazon and print ebook, audiobook, and on Instagram and Facebook if you want to see more of these things yes. there. Yes. They are so neat. Wow. So cool. I believe that's They're part so of cool. cool. <laughs> <laughs> and then pick up this book because it's got cool synesthesia stuff and it's fun. Hopefully I'll have the next book out this year. Mm-hmm. So all right, I'm Jessica Guernsey. You can find me at jessicaguernsey.com. Good luck spelling the last name there. And um I have short stories. I am also frequently at writing conferences. So if you have questions about submissions and guidelines and things like that, I'm always willing to um, take those questions. I might laugh at you, but I will answer your questions. I'm also on another panel later tonight at seven o'clock called, am I doing something stupid? And that's going to be fun. So you should guys all come. Well, the answer is probably yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, uh, you can find all my editing and book design services at looseleafep.com i provide services ranging from developmental editing all the way down to your post formatting proofread and my book design i offer lots of uh, a range of options depending on your budget so i have templates that you can use if you need it cheaper or I can do a fully custom design where I make like two or three different options for you and you get to pick one and we can kind of find whatever fits for you in that range. Uh, Michael Brent Collings. You can just Google Michael Brent. There is nobody else in the world named <laughs> Michael Brent with their first name. I 100% guarantee it. Um, you can also uh, text okay. books to 66866 and I will send you one of my books. And okay, I have a fairly expensive writing course that oh look at that bless you jessica Uh, i have a fairly expensive writing course that ltue is my favorite like bar none so good so i always put it on sale hugely so it's 90 percent off through sunday go to bit.ly slash learn with mbc and enter the code ltue 2021 awesome uh i'm stephen gashler i i write books i also do musical theater as i mentioned uh right now my theater company we're putting on a show that's my passion project i began in high school did it again 2015 and this is the third iteration of bums the musical and it's happening in march it's about singing dancing bums in 1929 just before the great depression it's a farcical comedy and it's lots of fun so if that uh if you're into that kind of thing go to bumsthemusical.com it's premiering at the angeles theater and spanish fork that's and i'll show them thank you